I am Terry Cook. You're watching Hamilton's Vital Signs, and we're back to talk about uh, things that uh, that matter in Hamilton. And my guests, welcoming back to the show, are Sarah Mayer of the Hamilton Social Planning and Research Council and Steve Bust, investigative reporter with the Hamilton Spectator. Great to have you both back. Um, Sarah, let me jump straight in, because you did a piece of work that uh, SBRC released and that Steve uh, wrote a number of uh, spec features on about the changing, it was called, I think, the changing face of Hamilton, looking at really the changing demographics in this community, I think shattering some preconceived notions about who we were and where we're going, and I think laying down some markers about some challenges that uh, that we're facing as a fairly dramatically changing community. So let me start by asking you, you were the researcher on that project, um, let's provide kind of a high level overview of, of some of the key findings. So um, some of the findings were, were known before, so we have an aging population as we do across Canada, but in, in Hamilton, um, we have a higher than average rate of, of older adults. Um, but then what was interesting that the research also found is that we also had very high growth in um, young adults. Mm -hmm. So we have kind of a, a polarizing, not polarizing, they're, they're both um, um, important demographics in, in different ways and, and complement each other in some ways. Um, and so, so that was one of the main things about, about sort of our, our growth um, and, that, and especially young people are leading to population growth, which we haven't seen in Hamilton. Our population growth has been very low. Um, and in now quite some time. And for quite some time. And yep. so now we're catching up to the provincial average. Um, and that's mainly due to um, younger people, both younger people staying in Hamilton and uh, younger people uh, coming to Hamilton. And the nature of who's coming is changing. Mm -hmm. So we um, have often been referred to as one of uh, the sort of three major areas where, Ham where uh, Canadian immigrants immigrate, Toronto, Vancouver, mm -hmm. and Hamilton. But that was really in the past. So um, post-war, um, different European countries uh, had a lot of immigration to Canada, including Hamilton. And But in the last f uh, few decades, that immigration has reduced. And from other countries, we, they've preferred other areas than Hamilton and so Hamilton has a below average rate of, of, of immigration in Hamilton compared to Ontario. Steve, um, you're perhaps best known, you've had a long and, and celebrated career at this spec, but I, I think it's fair to say that, that your Code Red series both has been nationally recognized with a number of awards but has frankly changed the course of conversations in Hamilton and, and it struck me that in your coverage of Sarah's report and, and the focus on demographics, that there were many overlays with the historical stuff you'd, dinner, you'd done around income inequality and some of the challenges uh, that were being presented to neighborhoods and to, to families and individuals. Can you talk a little bit about the, the stories you were telling and, and some of the thematic intersections between Code Red and, and the changing face of Hamilton? Yeah, and I, I think, you know, Code Red um, not to go back too far in, in history here, but I think one of the things about Code Red that uh, was most startling to people in Hamilton, and, and perhaps was that sort of you know slap across the face wake up call, was was the fact that um, it, it showed how poorly the health of poor people is across the city. How polarized we are when it comes to something that we take for granted as as a almost a right in Canada, the fact that we have this universal health care system. And so, you know, that I think woke people up. What the new numbers seem to be showing is that, as many people suspect, there is some prosperity coming to Hamilton. Mm -hmm. The face of Hamilton is changing. We're now seeing pockets of the city that, you know, were deprived places that seem to be thriving now, attracting new and different types of businesses, new and different types of people. Um, and so I think that in and of itself is interesting. I think what's going to be interesting is to then see how is this translating to something like a basic marker like health. Is the health of people in Hamilton also now starting to, to move along in, in lockstep with this new prosperity? And I think the other challenge that the series sort of brought up, uh, the new numbers brought up were What's happening to those people who were maybe disenfranchised, um, living in certain parts of the city where we now are seeing some 
prosperity, some higher real estate values. That's displacing people. Where are those displaced people going? Um, there would seem to be some evidence to suggest that lower income and poor people are moving more towards the east. Um, and, are they, or, and or parts of the mountain and or, inner and or suburbs. parts of the mountain. Yeah. I think the mountain is, yeah. is maybe a forgotten part of the puzzle here. I think we, yeah. we've long assumed that um, you know, the mountain is not just a physical barrier, it's also this sort of socioeconomic barrier that, that poverty and poor people were sort of locked into the lower inner city and you know the mountain was immune to that and I think that you know we're starting to see that now there are little pockets of deprivation that are creeping into places that we thought of previously as being well off and so so I think what's interesting is going to be to see you know how are people move, are, and are people just moving right out of the city altogether um, are they just being forced into other communities you know maybe down into Niagara well in Port Colborne places like that so let's talk about the ch the changing nature of immigration because one of the things that struck me was um, the the preconception that we have uh, that this is a place that historically has been based on it being a magnet for new Canadians and a place that is is particularly attractive especially to uh, folks who came post-war, um, especially large Italian, large Portuguese communities and other Western Euro European uh, folks. Um, how does the, the changing, for instance, the, the surge in, in visible, minorities, vi visible minorities create challenges both for those folks coming here that don't necessarily have the historic supports that you would have had if you came and, and you know, you had a home parish, a home community in a particular neighborhood to, to provide informal supports versus coming from a place where there would be less uh, kind of built-in stability and, and leverage for folks to get started. I think um, certainly one of the, uh, Hamilton's growth in the post-war period can definitely be attributed in part to our large cohort of immigrants. And the fact that we don't have that as much now is a is a problem for our economy and our local economy and but I think the city has started to take steps in that and are realizing that you can't just kind of sit back and expect immigrants to mm -hmm. come here you have to be attracting them yep. and you're right that people do come um, you know networks are so important and so if you don't have that um, initial community people don't want to come because they don't feel like they know anyone or mm -hmm. even if they don't know the person the fact that they come from my village or near my village they know my village's name um, is so important important and 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 for bonding for for creating community so um, I think it's it's uh, it's important that the, the city takes steps and and we've seen that through Global Hamilton and other initiatives that they have the Hamilton Immigration Partnership Council um, to start kind of advertising Hamilton as a destination for immigrants um, and have more supports for immigrants um, supports are, are now much more comprehend uh, coordinated than they used to be um, and so and and are through a wide variety Variety of agencies, which requires a lot of communication, but we've seen um, we uh, that that they have done that. And I think what's interesting is uh, even though we've had l less immigration, we've uh, uh, Hamilton's cultural diversity continues to grow, mm -hmm. and so we we have seen. Um, growth in visible minorities and Aboriginal people in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. ha Hamilton's Aboriginals have um, the highest. Um, uh, a very high growth, especially among young people. So um, uh, we're always going to uh, continue to be more and more diverse, and we have to have um, institutions and um, and community support for people from various backgrounds. Uh, Steve, one of the great things that that your work did was, I think, um, personalize the experience of folks that were new arrivals and in some cases who had faced real hardship and and kind of the stories are. are rather depressing and others that that were more inspiring and I, I, I'd like you to just talk about the experience of writing about the lives of, of some of the folks who you I think uh, gave voice to in the course of your your series especially the, the newcomers to Hamilton and some of the challenges that they they faced absolutely you know um, so, you know a lot of times it's it's when you uh, when you talk to people who've come from somewhere else that it gives you a fresh love and appreciation of a place you know where you live and and um, you know we can become sort of blase and and you know who don't think a lot about it it's just the place where we live and it's when you hear it from somebody else's 
mouth and uh, somebody who's seen it with their own eyes and it reminds you of, of what why it's home and mm -hmm. so you know I, I think about uh, the young woman uh, Joseline Nicholas uh, 25 years old who came here from Malawi in you know southeastern uh, corner of Africa she came here she won a, um, a, a bursary to study mm -hmm. economics at McMaster and and basically said that you know pretty much from the moment she arrived here she felt like she had found a new home and uh, um, you know she's now studying her masters at uh, Laurier but even though she's going to school in in uh, Waterloo she's still living in Hamilton because this is where she wants to be and when she's done she intends to be back here in Hamilton and and you know you ask her well how long do you want to stay in Hamilton and she says forever you know this is just a place that she loves she loves the people she loves the the warmth of the people she she's felt welcome ever since the first day that she's been here and you know something like that as corny as it might may sound and as as cliched as it may sound you know it's it's those are the kind of things that put a little extra spring in your step you know when you hear that somebody loves your place mm -hmm. you know hopefully as much as you love it yourself yeah i've i've often said that uh, when we look to the future of hamilton uh, in fact we'll be saved by the folks who have been transplanted here from other places because they don't come with the same preconceived notions of the challenges that we can't overcome and they come with a, a real appreciation for things that those of us who have been born and raised here often miss and uh, I think that's an important perspective in terms of the many positive contributions newcomers are making. Uh, we got to go to a break. I'm with Sarah Merritt, Mayo of the Social Planning and Research Council, Steve Buse from the Hamilton Spectator. We will be right back. I'm Terry Cook and you're watching Hamilton's Vital Signs. That was quick and dirty. Sure, I nibble, but that doesn't make me a nibbler. I'm a social nibbler. I just do it when I'm out. It's not like I buy my own nibbles. I don't have to. I can just bum a nibble from my friends. I don't call myself a nibbler because I'm not addicted to it. It's just something I do for fun. I'm a social nibbler. Can't you see the difference? I'm Terry Cook, you're watching Hamilton's Vital Signs, and we're back talking about the changing face of Hamilton with Steve Bust and Hamilton Spectator, and Sarah Mayo from the Social Planning and Research Council. And I, I wanna come back to uh, the things that may have surprised both of you as kind of experienced students of Hamilton and its demographics from the work that, uh, that you did initially and that Steve reported extensively on. So what, what surprised you? Um, I would say, and, and Steve and I talked about this beforehand, and I think we both agreed that kids, um, the the the, re the reduction in um, birth rates, um, we've seen that Hamilton's um, birth rate uh, has has reduced a bit compared to other cities, and and how that bodes. You know, so we have these extra young people, and you would think that we would that would mean we would start having more kids, mm -hmm. um, but we we haven't really seen that, and so that's a. Uh, um, an issue that may, you know, kind of mean our growth will, will will not continue to be strong in the future. Well, and it strikes me that it also means that we will rely even more on making this an attractive destination for people who choose to come here from other places. Uh, because in the absence of that, um, the cost of our infrastructure and the services that we rely upon will be shared by a smaller, a diminishing base. And and also, but I think just as importantly, I think we have to create more conditions for people to f to feel like they can have children. So the um, you know the argument that that I made in the in through the research was that the, we linked it to other research we've done around precarious employment of mm -hmm. young people and how RP and higher um, mm -hmm. housing costs are people feeling like they just. Can't 
can't afford right. to have children. For sure. What surprised you? Yeah, well, j just to, to sort of piggyback on, on Sarah's comment, it, it's not just, it's not just the, the fact that there are fewer children in Hamilton. It's just how, how startling that number is. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, I think what we reported was that there are a net loss of 32 schools mm -hmm. in Hamilton over just a 15-year period, which, frankly, is startling. As I, as I pointed out in the piece, that number of schools mm -hmm. is actually more than the entire Lakehead District School Board, which yeah. serves Thunder Bay and surrounding areas. So think of it as sort of the disappearance of, of a school board, school system. you know, yeah. um, and that's just within the city of Hamilton. And, and so, I mean, I'm sure that there are bigger trends at play here. I mean, you know, f Western, uh, Western world families are just having fewer mm -hmm. children in general. Yeah. Um, but certainly there's an economic component to it. And as Sarah said, you know, one of the people I spoke to for this piece, you know, 29 year old uh, young woman by the name of Sarah Milligan, she, you know, she's postponed having a child because her and her husband uh, live in an apartment. Mm -hmm. uh, they watch uh, real estate prices rising by the day, it seems, mm -hmm. um, and their jobs are not as stable as they would like at this point in their life. And so they're basically saying, you know, the economic future for us and the lack of, of affordable uh, uh, houses to purchase here in Hamilton is just sort of pushing the goalposts farther and farther away from them. So, Sarah, uh, in, in previous conversations, we talked about something Steve mentioned on the front end of the program, which is the movement of poverty caused by raising, rising real estate prices, in some cases the absence of services, uh, folks just trying to find a beachhead in which they can actually enjoy a decent standard of living. Talk about how real that is and how that plays itself out relative to uh, the services that will be required, things like affordable housing, and really other pressures that we're seeing uh, that, that this community is, is really just starting to come to grips with. Yeah, well, we know that, uh, you know, it's uh, so much of it is market forces mm -hmm. and that are not, uh, you know, natural. They can be controlled by different governments, choose to, to react to them in different ways. So mm -hmm. in Quebec, there's much more, um, there's a m m much more social housing mm -hmm. and there's also much, much, um, uh, more strict rent controls right. and so Montreal has not seen the enormous um, increase in housing prices that we've seen in other communities in Canada and Toronto has obviously had huge uh, increases and so their poverty that used to be more centralized mm -hmm. is now up, at, up out in the suburbs yeah. and so inner ring suburbs inner ring yeah. suburbs yes and so is that happening um, in Hamilton too that's certainly um, uh, the case and and I mean really you, any poverty map is driven by where social housing is mm -hmm. and where cheap market housing is so yeah. it really is just a uh, a reflection of where the um, uh, it's a housing map mm -hmm. more than you know an income map in some ways and so um, we are seeing very high rent increases especially in Hamilton West and Dundas um, and um, and so we are seeing um, uh, that, that 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 is likely to um, change the the map of poverty in Hamilton. And and the other piece for new arrivals who tend to be people at the lower end of the socio mm -hmm. uh, sec socioeconomic bracket is that often their ladder out of poverty is to start small businesses mm -hmm. and and to have an opportunity to to establish something that generates an income for a family and allows the next generation to go on and do other things. Um, that seems to be um, not as successful here as, as we need it to be. Can you talk a little bit about how the, kind of the pa pattern of, of new arrivals um, finding opportunity and whether or not it's happening? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, again, you know, there's sort of global forces on that. You yeah. know, certainly retail is not as uh, strong as it used to be because of so much online shopping. Right. Um, and so so it's more difficult to start um, some types of businesses than it was before. Um, and I, um, you know, and so, so our... Even even corner stores are not as um, profitable as they used to be, um, and so that's certainly a concern. And and we know that that self-employment is a uh, is is sort of 
many different types of people, not just immigrants, turn to self-employment when in, in tougher times. And sometimes it's successful and sometimes it isn't. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a drain on, on people's family income more than a, a, a net um, bringer in of, of money. And so it's, it's, a, it's something that, that, that's important to take advantage of the resources that are out there to help with um, starting up a small business. The city of Hamilton has a number of very good uh, small business entrepreneurship programs and, and links to other programs so that people have the support and that they know that they're, um, they have a better chance of their business being successful. Um, I want to turn to challenges and opportunities because for those who are op optimists, you're going to look at this uh, kind of roadmap of, of changing face of Hamilton and say, well, we're getting more millennials. That means more talent, more entrepreneurship, folks who are invested in the future of the community, and, and a new sense of optimism. On the other hand, you can find lots to be discouraged about. Let me start on the challenges side. Steve, what do you see in this? in the work that you did and, and Sarah's report that, that you think we as decision makers, leaders, and citizens here need to be worried about? So, so I guess um, the challenges that I see would be, um, yes, th there is, I think undeniably, there's, there's some prosperity flowing into Hamilton. I think one of the challenges is that that might create pockets of deprivation in places where we we now, you know, we used to paint the broad, the brush strokes broadly and say, that's a disadvantaged area, that's an area with advantages. Mm -hmm. Now I think what might happen is you might see some of these disadvantaged areas have prosperity and we f might forget that within there, there's still going to be pockets of, of people that are disadvantaged or disenfranchised. So there's that, there's the... I think one challenge for us is a challenge that all of Southern Ontario is facing right now, and that's just gridlock. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, just moving around this area is becoming uh, more and more of a challenge day by day, it seems. Um, I think another challenge that we, that we have is um, we still have some health issues here in Hamilton um, in terms of you know, the, the link that we've shown between uh, income and health. And, uh, yeah. um, and I think the other challenge is that, um, you know, we talked about, you know, immigration driving, um, you know, immigration was, a, was a, you know, coming to Hamilton 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. I think the big driver of that was the fact that we had yeah. large employers, yeah. the, ty the types of places that employed thousands, if not tens of thousands of people. And we all know that those days are, are finished, yeah. you know. Uh, we jump for joy and, and counselors, you know, say hallelujah if we can attract a place that has 300 or 400 jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, back at a time when we used to have places that had 15,000 jobs in one location. Yep. And so those days are done. So, you know, the challenge is how do you continue to find employment for the people that, you're, that are coming to your, to your city? In the two and a half minutes we have left, sir, let me turn to you and say, so what are the opportunities that are presented with the changing face of Hamilton? I think, um, I mean, I think this research and other research has shown that youth are really driving the growth. It used to be kind of more immigrants are driving the growth. Now it's young people are driving the growth. Mm -hmm. um, um, and we, in, including young immigrants, not, um, and uh, and so providing services that improve, that, that, that continue to attract them. We know that housing prices um, is one of the main attractors um, for uh, youth, but also transit. Mm -hmm. And so is there um, more that can be done in the short term? You know, certainly LRT is, is uh, one of um, something that many youth are looking forward to, mm -hmm. but is there before then, is there more that can be done to improve transit for people across the city, especially as um, um, our city develops and, and has pockets of, of lower income people across the city? Not that transit is just for low income people, but right. it's certainly um, uh, important for uh, if you can't afford a car to be able yeah. to and of course the, bus. the dangerous digression when you get into an LRT discussion in this community is it's really about a broader system yes. enhancement that includes everything from yeah. all day go service from mm -hmm. Union Station into Hamilton to uh, the ability to expand HSR service to a whole bunch of neighborhoods mm -hmm. that will require mm -hmm. it both as our neighborhoods age mm -hmm. and as younger people choose not yeah. to have their own vehicles yeah. and I think that uh, that too presents some, some challenges if we don't respond in advance. 
opportunities in the minute we have left. So I, I would say that uh, Hamilton has three reasonably large post-secondary institutions that have tens of thousands of students who are either from Hamilton or come to Hamilton. Um, I think a great opportunity is you know, going to be Hamilton's ability to keep those people here. These are well-educated, bright people mm -hmm. who can help build a city. And, and, so, and I think we're seeing from some of the numbers that Sarah reported that, in fact, Hamilton's doing a great job of attracting people from across the province to come to Hamilton and to keep people here that come here to study and you know those are the kinds of people and jobs that you know will make this uh, the ambitious city. And on that perfect note uh, we are out of time. Uh, I want to thank Steve Bust and Sarah Mayo for joining us again t today and talking about the, the uh, the changing face of Hamilton and and thank you both for the work that you are doing to I think build resilience and a, a sense of optimism both about uh, uh, the realities we face today but also the opportunities that the, the future presents. Um, good to have you both back. I'm Terry Cook. You've been watching Hamilton's Vital Signs. As always you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We hope you will join us again next month to uh, to talk about our hometown. Take care. Thank you both.